Hello, welcome to our online service this Sunday. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the student ministers here. Uh, this is our last pre-recorded service uh, before we return to uh, face-to-face meetings and live streaming the service next Sunday. Uh, but as we eagerly await that return, uh, we need to remind ourselves that we more eagerly await uh, God's will to be done and for God's kingdom to come fully on earth. And so we're going to sing about that now. As long as life 
Even though we love God, uh, we still choose to sin so often. Uh, but as it says in 1 John, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and forgives us and purifies us from all unrighteousness. So let's confess our sins together now. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life in your Son, Jesus Christ, who has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yet we still fail to love you with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Pardon our offenses, we pray, and make us clean, that we may continue as members of Christ, in whom alone is salvation. Amen. Uh, let's uh, claim that forgiveness and, and know that it is, it is true, uh, as God has promised. We are forgiven. Uh, just a reminder about Little Church, uh, this great resource that we've been producing uh, over the, the COVID time that we'll keep producing even as services go, go live. Uh, so please, if you have kids or anyone who could, uh, friends and families with kids that could benefit from this resource, please check it out. And we're going to take the time to check in now. So uh, yeah, if you are watching online with us, please uh, go to the link that you can see uh, and check in so, that, so we know that you are with us and uh, you can let us know how we can be praying for you, uh, how, how we can help you.
Hi, I'm Jen, and today I'm going to read to you from Galatians, starting at chapter 3, verses 23, and finishing at chapter 4, verses 7. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the law. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Hello, my name is David Honey, and I'm one of the congregation members here at NEAC, and I have the privilege of sharing God's word with you today. I want to start with a phrase, a catch cry, that's become emblematic in our contemporary culture. Don't find yourself on the wrong side of history. At the moment, though, it seems all too easy to find yourself on the wrong side of history. Our news feeds are filled with pictures of angry mobs defacing and destroying monuments to colonialism, which proves that justice has a long memory and those who were fated yesterday may well be denounced today. As we anticipate coming out of the historic pandemic exile, we of Newtown and Erskineville Anglican Church have spent these last few weeks of digital connection reflecting on what it means to be the Church of Jesus Christ. We started this process by reflecting on the glorious future that awaits us, the promise of being gathered together bodily before the glorified Lord Jesus. Next, we reflected on God's promise of the church as a new humanity in Christ, one that breaks down the present divisions between social groupings and deconstructs the whole concept of race relations. Having situated ourselves towards the coming kingdom and in the present of a distinct and new people, we now need to meditate on the past of our gospel story the history of promise fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, and what that promise means for us to be on the right side of history. As we reflect back on the story of the Christian church, we'll see that the children of Abraham are those who live by the spirit of the Lord Jesus and are therefore those who live trusting in mercy against the demands of justice. The children of Abraham live in mercy against the demands of justice. But before we look at more of that, let me pray for us. Our great God and loving Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of all and the judge of all the earth. Father, we pray that you would have mercy on us. As the children of Abraham, give us the gift of your spirit that opens our eyes to the gift of the Lord Jesus, that we might live by faith in him. And we pray this for his glory's sake. Amen. My key verse for today, I'll keep coming back to this, is from Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. It came in the middle of the Bible reading we just heard. Paul writes to the Galatians, Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. In the Bible, the right side of history is captured in this phrase, the children of Abraham. In the greater Bible story arc, to be on the right side of history is to be or belong to the children of Abraham. Nearly 4,000 years ago, God spoke to a Bedouin herdsman in ancient Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, a man named Abraham. And back in Genesis chapter 12, God made these promises to Abraham. We can read them there. God said, 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. The children or descendants of Abraham are that particular group through whom God is going to reverse the disaster of humanity's rebellion against their creator and we re that we read about in the beginning of the Bible story. The children of Abraham will be great, blessed by God, and also a blessing to others. In fact, to all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through them, blessed with mercy. From these promises, we see that God intended to show mercy on humankind despite their failings, and make a way for all people to share in those blessings. Now, despite the magnitude of these promises, Abraham was a pretty ordinary man who made bad decisions that had lasting consequences. In fact, some would draw a line from the current crisis in the Middle East, that is, all the bad blood between Israel and Palestine or any of the other Arab nations, some would draw a straight line back through the simple foolish choices that this man, Abraham, and his wife, Sarah, made. Nevertheless, Abraham trusted that God would make good on his promises. He and his wife, Sarah, were blessed by God and so took their place on the right side of history. The children of Abraham grew into the nation of Israel, the Jews, and to enable them to live as the children of Abraham and therefore God's special people, God gave them a law, most commonly known as the Ten Commandments. If the people kept the law, they would live under the promises that God made to Abraham. They would remain on the right side of history. But they couldn't uphold God's law. And in the end, that law served only to condemn them. Paul speaks about it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. All those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. You see, if you can't keep the whole of the law, then you might as well not keep any of it. You've failed. But laws don't change hearts. God knew this, and so he promised to intervene in the lives of Abraham's children in two spectacular ways. First, by sending his son into the line of Abraham to be born under the law of Israel. Or as Paul describes it in Galatians chapter 4, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we may receive adoption to sonship. That adoption was to the sonship in the line of Abraham. The son of Abraham was none other than Jesus of Nazareth, who in the power of God's spirit, not only fulfilled the purpose of the law, but also fulfilled the just requirements of Israel's failure to uphold the law. Or as Paul says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. So now, in the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham and in keeping with the law of Israel, anyone who trusts in Jesus as Saviour, is considered by God to be a child of Abraham, to be on the right side of history. Paul calls this justification, or being considered righteous by God. But it's not always easy to trust God. Abraham certainly had trouble with it. In fact, the Bible goes even further than this and states that it's not possible to trust God without his second spectacular intervention. And that was the gift of his spirit to enable the uh, children of Abraham to trust in God's promises and so become the spiritual heirs of those promises. Paul talks about it like this in Galatians chapter 3. God redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that is, not the Jews, through Christ Jesus, so that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Seeing and knowing that sinful people would fail under the law, God had nevertheless always intended to enable his people to receive the blessing of Abraham. In fact, now anyone can be on the right side of history. 
Some 800 years before Jesus' ministry, the prophet Ezekiel saw this. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The gift of God's spirit enables anyone to trust in the work of Jesus for them. So that instead of living according to the law of Israel, anyone, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, man or woman, can live before God by faith. So we come back to our key verse. Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Now the church in Galatia, to whom this letter is written, they were in danger of ending up on the wrong side of history. They began well, gratefully accepting the gift of God's Spirit, their place in the Spirit's work, but the pull of tradition is dragging them back from the, to the wrong side of history. Paul describes it like this in chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish after beginning by the means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by the means of the flesh? You see, the Galatians are facing a crisis of confidence. They're more concerned to be justified by the history of the people, defined by laws that govern the flesh, rather than risking the freedom of living by faith in the work of the Spirit. But laws don't change hearts. Because, as Paul mentioned earlier, if you can't keep the whole of the law, you might as well not keep any of it. What's more, the people's laws have a way of changing, becoming obsolete. The anger and protests of denunciation that are ablaze on social media at the moment reflect the latest in a long line of attempts to right the wrongs of history. And in doing so, they're declaring that which was legal to now be obsolete. In fact, detestable. So now, men like Winston Churchill, who led England and Europe through the greatest crisis of the 20th century, face the swift and terrible justice of revolutionary zeal because he's on record as being a racist. Now the Galatians are in an even worse situation because they want to exchange the mercy of God on offer through Jesus for the justice of God, which never changes. Paul says, clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. See, here Paul is agonising with the church the only way to be justified before God, to be the children of Abraham, to be on the right side of history, is to live by the Spirit of God, trusting that Jesus is the greatest son of Abraham and has borne the curse of the law for you. That's the faith of the children of Abraham, those with the spirit of Jesus who call out for mercy under the threat of justice. Paul describes it in chapter 4. Because you are his sons, God sent his spirit, the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. As we prepare to be released from the constraints of this pandemic, the constraints that have reduced our life as the church to the absolute minimum, let's not waste the opportunity to reflect on who we are as the children of Abraham, those who live by faith in Jesus, those who live on the right side of the history of God's mercy. Paul had to remind the Galatians not to forget their place in that history. And my concern is that I'm not always confident that being justified before God, being considered a child of Abraham, to be on this side of history is always what motivates us as a church, whether it be corporately or individually. I wonder sometimes that it's not more important for us to be justified before the judgment seat of Twitter or Instagram. I think most of us know well the thrill of fear when we post something that's against the grain of a discussion thread, the weight of shame, how anxiously we hang on the justifying power of likes. If I'm honest with myself, in the day-to-day, 
I think I'm far more concerned at times about being justified by my attitude towards race or gender or sexuality or the environment. And the laws that govern these things change if you wait long enough. Yesterday's heroes can all too easily become today's villains. Because laws don't change hearts, do they? Only the spirit of God's mercy can do that. The current uprising following the death of George Floyd shows us that you can't escape the judgment of the people and their wrath, and there's no mercy in a revolution. To be sure, black lives matter because Jesus died for them. Women of all colours deserve honour among us because the Son of God gave his life for them. And human sexuality matters because God the Son bore the curse that otherwise distorts and demeans our bodies, genders and identities. But the curse that Christ bore for us will save us from the judgment and wrath of God. At the same time, the gift of the Spirit who comes through Christ means that the church, as the children of Abraham, are on God's side of history. Or as Paul said, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Paul is telling us that the way to be on God's side of history and to escape the judgment of all and any law is to trust in the sacrifice of Christ, who fulfilled the law perfectly, but offered himself as a substitute that we might receive mercy. God's side of history offers mercy to the fallen, freedom from the past, and hope for the coming judgment. Let's be the children of Abraham who live on the side of history blessed by mercy and the gift of faith. Let's call ourselves the children of Abraham. And when we come back together, let's introduce ourselves as those who've received mercy. Let me pray for us. Our great God and loving Heavenly Father, we pray for mercy. We pray, Lord, that the, your Spirit would work in our hearts to hear the call, to receive the mercy that comes through Jesus, to take our place in the children of Abraham, in that line, and be on your side of history. Give us confidence in that promise and empower us with your Spirit to be those who live in the light of your mercy and all this so that Jesus might be glorified among us. Amen. Well, there is so much happening in our life together as God's people at the moment. God is richly working among us, and we're thankful for all of his provision and all he is enabling us to do in this season. And so we're just going to spend a moment thinking about the richness of that life and what God is doing in us and through us. First thing to say is that on Monday night, the parish council conducted the AGM, as we've been talking about the last two weeks. If you want to see the details of that and review the Zoom footage, you can go to the weekly email and see all the details of what happened as we celebrated God's abundance to us, God's abundance to us, even in this year of transition and this year of pandemic. We're continuing to pray together, uh, to lift things up to our Lord and to, to ask our Heavenly Father to lead us through this season. It's still uncertain, isn't it? So we need to pray. Come pray on Wednesdays. Come pray in other groups. Come pray whenever you can for God's work here at the moment. We're having a working bee on the 18th of July, and that's very timely, given that we're going to relaunch all our services on the 19th of July. And so this is the perfect opportunity to get our house in order, to make sure everything is clean and tidy, and make sure it's welcoming for anyone who's new. If you could spare even 15 minutes between 9 and 12 on the 18th of July, that would be a great blessing to God's people here. Uh, there'll be ways for you to uh, signal in the week ahead uh, the way you can help and different jobs that will be available, and we'd love you to sign up uh, and get involved in whatever way you are able to. As I've been saying, we're relaunching church on the 19th of July. We're really excited about that. We've been testing systems. We've been making sure that our check-in system works, that we can clean effectively straight after the service. Uh, we've been uh, making sure everything will work well for the 19th. Uh, in this coming week, you'll see more details on the website just uh, up to my right, neac.com.au slash Sunday. That's where all the details will be. 
uh, of, uh, of our check-in, of how things will be safe, and all that's going to progressively go up over this week, and we'll direct you to it later in the week so you know everything that's going to happen. To reiterate what we've been saying for the last couple of weeks is that we will not be opening our Erskineville campus, but opening up St. Stephen's in the morning in particular at 9 a.m. and at 11 a.m. with kids' things happening at both. If you haven't worked out which one of those two you're going to, uh, that'd be a really good thing to have a chat to me or Mike or Megan or Kez about, uh, just to work out which one will be best for you and your family right now. But stick to this website this week and we'll have all the details uh, that will help you understand exactly what uh, to expect on July 19. Hi, I'm Frank. And today, as we pray, we'll especially be remembering the limbs and Ben's work at Sydney University. So let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you for all your blessings to us and that you have preserved us in difficult times. We look forward to being able to meet together again and we pray for our leaders in all the arrangements needed to make our church meetings possible. We pray for both our leaders and ourselves as we work together to encourage one another to live for you. We pray especially for our ministries involving children, which have been so difficult for many months. And we pray for patience as the team continues to grapple with changing restrictions. We pray that our children will continue to hear your word taught. We also continue to pray for the nominators as they work to appoint a new rector. And then in the meantime, you'll uphold Matt and the ministry team as they lead us. We pray today for our members who are working with students at Sydney University for the work of Ben Lim, as he works with overseas students, and especially for all the obstacles to meeting in person which have arisen due to the COVID restrictions. Even so, we thank you for the five students who have come to believe in Christ this year, and we do pray that they will continue to grow and thrive. We thank you that Ben has been able to keep in contact with and to encourage students. We pray for the EU annual conference later this month, which also has to be online. We pray that it will still be a blessing for all who attend. We pray too for Sian and the boys, that you'll be blessing them. We pray especially for health and strength as they've been sick recently. And thank you for the recent opportunity for a break to recuperate. We pray too for Celia Toos, who's also working with EU and preparing for ANCON. And we pray that EU will continue to grow in strength next year after this year, which has been so unusual with relationship building activities so restricted. We thank you that Australia has for the most part had a low COVID infection rate and we pray for our Prime Minister and other members of government as they make difficult decisions in order to protect lives and livelihoods. We are conscious that the consequences of COVID are far worse in many places in the world and we do pray for your mercy. We pray that our hearts will look to you for our ultimate safety and security. And we do pray that the work of the gospel will be able to continue unhindered in the world. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's finish our time in prayer by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now let's sing our last song together. Uh, it's called, We Belong to the Day.
to Jesus, to Jesus. Well, 2020 will go down in history as a big year. Uh, Many things have happened. Many things seem to continue to be happening. Uh, But we've been reminded today that we are on the right side of history, uh, not because of any human approval, but because of uh, the death of Christ and because we are justified by faith. Uh, Please join us online. Uh, The the Zoom call will be coming up in the chat box. And uh, may you love and serve the Lord this week. Jesus.